Hi, I'm recording this video for my GCSE and GCE A-level electronics students. If you're not one of my students and you haven't seen any of my videos yet, please do subscribe, give the videos a thumbs up and feel free to ask comments too. So in this video, we're going to have a look at, well, I've described it or I've put the subtitle here of a typical project. It's not actually a typical student project. In fact, I wrote it. And it's not necessarily exactly what I would be expecting from a project, but it might give you a flavour of the sort of things I would like to see in a project, okay, an electronics project. Now, you've got to be careful uh, when you look at this document because it's not a template and it's not an instruction for me telling you exactly what should be in your project. I've only uh, considered the early stages of the project. This is not a complete project written in an evening, but um, it starts with the initial system planning stages, which often students spend far too long on, and then a, a little bit of development of one, uh, just one subsystem of potentially many. We would normally start off most projects, whether they are A-level or GCSE, with identifying a problem. It's usual to identify a problem which then is going to then generate some ideas, opportunities to then uh, identify a product that can be uh, designed and built, rather than saying, I want to build A, and then start off with what you want to build, uh, and then, uh, then have to think backwards to uh, what problem uh, could exist to actually have, uh, to uh, necessitate uh, that product, okay? But having said that, some students do like to think, they think, oh yeah, I want to make a, I don't know, lab power supply, and then you've got to think back, well, what is the problem that means that I need to have a lab power supply? But generally speaking, it's a good idea to actually do it as the exam boards suggest, and that's to, like, first of all, identify a problem. So in this particular case, the problem that I'm identifying is just that it's dangerous to walk along the road in the dark. OK, now when you um, do this, uh, when you do this identification of the problem, you might find you sort of consider who, the what, the why, the where, the when, those sorts of things. OK, now if you uh, want to include a photo, nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it's useful, but don't just do it for the sake of uh, filling out a page. Uh, do make sure that you include a link, unless I'm assuming that it's going to come off the Internet. And so it's quite clearly not your own work. OK, so you are crediting whoever or crediting the page with wherever it came from. Now, um, for GCSE and A-level, then you have to further analyse the problem. So this first thing is fairly short and snappy. And then you're supposed to analyse the problem. In other words, you're supposed to break it down so that you actually understand. And it's not just an effort of just showing that you understand. It's actually, hopefully, if you do this right, it's actually going to help you break the problem down and understand what the key things, the key outcomes are that you need to uh, achieve to solve the problem. OK, so that's what I've done there. And, you know, maybe it's going to be half a page. Maybe it's going to be a page or more, but it shouldn't just be like a couple of sentences. So you break that problem down, depending on the, you know, the size complexity of the problem, it might take a bit longer than this. So in this particular one, I've con maybe I've considered something like portability, uh, the power supply, existing products that might be available and why they are um, not suitable or whatever, uh, safety, usability, etc. OK. Now, there is a general point I've made here. Uh, if you're using Word and you're using a multi-page Word document, then do use the features of Word like heading styles, paragraph styles, inserting page breaks, things like that. I'm going to try not to make this an ICT lesson, but you should be using those things. Having uh, analysed a problem, then it's quite normal to then come up with a design brief. Now, the design brief is a fairly, um, well, it's brief, it's short, and it's a, a statement that you could then give to a designer. And then the designer will then take that brief, uh, an instruction, in other words, and then go away and then uh, come back with an idea, a plan of what you should be making. So you tell him what the outcomes will be of a successful product, and then they design the product for you. Once you've done the design brief, and by the way, if you're doing the A-level, you're probably going to have to do some research as well. Do check the mark sheets so that all the mark sheets now, the task sheets uh, give you all the details of things that you need to do. Let's just move on then to the design specification. So most coursework tasks are going to require that you write up a design specification. Uh, 
and I like seeing it in a table. Okay, it doesn't mean you have to uh, prepare it in a table, and most definitely doesn't mean you have to use these column headings because you don't. Uh, but it's useful if you have it in a table, and the reason for that is that when you do your final evaluation, it's very easy to then say just copy this entire table paste it into the uh, end of your uh, report, maybe add another couple of columns, and then you can then discuss each point, point in turn, saying about whether or not they, you were successful. Um, the design specification um, is supposed to uh, say what the successful product will actually do, or how it will function, or whatever it happens to be. Now, you have to uh, use objective criteria and not these things called subjective criteria. So subjective would be something like flash quickly or look good or run, run fast or uh, operate for a long time. Those are all subjective because one person's idea of being fast or work well or something like that is down to personal opinion. You don't want any personal opinion points because they're much more difficult to test. You want objective points. You know, something like it must be battery powered because it's either battery powered or not. Uh, and then also we can split these objective points into things that are quantitative. That in other words, quantities, things that we can um, we can specify as a number. For example, uh, must be able to run for at least 40 minutes. And qualitative. Now qualitative are just features. So for example. It must be battery powered. I'm not saying how many batteries, I'm just saying it must be battery powered. Um, a flashing sequence should begin when a single button is pressed. Now that is a quality, that's a feature or a function. It's not a quantity. I'm not saying how many times that button, although I did say a single button, um, but uh, I'm not saying how many times that button will be pressed. Now, common to GCSE and A-level, a system block diagram is really going to help uh, break up what is uh, probably a fairly complex uh, problem or a complex product into much smaller, more manageable chunks. Now, even though this example project here is just basically a flashing light, a flashing beacon, uh, we could split that up into several different uh, subsystems. Now, subsystem just takes an input, does process an output, just leave it fairly open for transducer driver because then when you actually do your subsystem development, it gives you the opportunity to be flexible and actually change your mind on exactly how you want to do it. Um, the whole idea of breaking a big uh, complex problem into smaller problems, we could call the systems approach to design. And one of the big advantages on our big advantages of that is you could actually take one of these subsystems um, and then swap it with another another subsystem which uh, did the same function but did it in a different way and that means that it should be possible for you to actually develop each one of these subsystems separately and if you don't like them for some reason you can change them and it's not going to affect the other sort of chain of subsystems and it might well be that you want to create multiple like alternatives or consider at least different uh, ways of doing one particular subsystem and then justify which one you've chosen. Make sure you've got a suitable title that's easy to understand. Don't just say switch subsystem because you know switch or what, you know, that's useless. Explain what it's going to do, explain its operation, uh, maybe even explain how it works. Now a switch in itself probably isn't really going to rank as a subsystem, but in uh, in combination, say, with a pull-up or pull-down resistor or even debouncing circuit, then that becomes much more like a subsystem, particularly for A-level. You're not going to get away with just presenting the switch as a subsystem. Uh, truth tables are a good idea. Remember, if you want more, like if you want a slower look at what I'm presenting here, you can just pause, pause the video, can't you? Uh, so if you use values, uh, valued resistors, which you should be doing, uh, don't just accept the defaults in Circuit Wizard. Um, yeah, so justify your values, show calculations. Uh, here I've used the, the equation editor. So if you go insert uh, equation, then you can insert an equation and do explain why you're doing the uh, calculation and then do the calculation and then explain what the result was and then what you're going to do with it. It's really next to useless when students uh, just do a calculation and no explanation at all. And I've seen quite a few students uh, calculate, say, a resistor value, a capacitor value, and then they don't even use that value in the circuit. And they think, well, what was the point now? 
So once you've done the initial design, then testing simulated in Circuit Wizard would be fine, but you need to say what you will do. Uh, future tense is what you should be saying, not saying I tested it and it worked. You know, I will check and then you say what you're actually going to check. Uh, then tabulated test results. That means you put the results into a table. I would say that's almost mandatory. Uh, students who don't do that invariably are not doing a good job. So if you just say I tested it and it worked or, you know, the voltage out was as expected or something, that's probably not going to be right because you actually need to log the results. OK, uh, if you can uh, screen capture graphs as well, that's good, but only if you annotate them and actually make some use of them. Uh, and then virtual or simulated testing on its own is not going to be good enough. So you also need to have real world testing, preferably on breadboard, I would say. And so here's an example of my prototype circuit I'm going to build. And then I explain what I will do. Now, by the way, uh, these uh, show voltmeters, but no one uses voltmeters. We all use digital multimeters and then we then use voltage range. So you might want to mention that you're, you're using a digital multimeter and you're going to test voltage. And you might even explain about where you're going to stick the probes as well. This is future tense, OK? And then you're then going to actually then have the test results and maybe a photo or something showing the confirmation that you have actually had a circuit built and you've done some testing. I don't think you need to show every test that you've done but do show that you have used some test equipment. Uh, A-Level, I think, actually expects in the mark scheme that you've used a range of test equipment. The GCSE doesn't, but then again, I've got lots of students who are using uh, oscilloscopes and certainly multimeters and uh, function generators. So, you know, if you're using that even at GCSE level, you should be showing that because it's like, you know, really well done. Invariably, something isn't quite like you predict. So if you thought that, say, the voltage was going to be six, but it's actually 5.86, well, the chances are it's probably because your battery wasn't six volts. OK, so you can comment on that. You, that it's always uh, quite clear to me when students have actually made up the test results because they are the results are too good. All right. It's, it's really obvious. And if, if you're one of my students, you do that, you're just going to get the work back. No point in lying about it. So then you need to come to a conclusion for that subsystem. And then presumably you're going to need to do that for all of your subsystems. Typically in most assessed coursework, you're going to be um, doing the initial uh, system planning, then develop per subsystem, and then probably then do a whole circuit, bring all the subsystems together, uh, check that that works. Uh, document that, comment on it, and then do an evaluation as well, and maybe uh, cross-reference with your original design specification. So I hope that gives you an idea. That's probably once, if I do any editing on this, it's probably going to be about 15 minutes. I hope it's not too long. If you found it useful, please do subscribe and give the videos a thumbs up, because it does take me a bit of a while uh, to do this. And I uh, hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.